Hello, welcome to Bare Bones Bio. We will be going over the most important details of many biological processes on this channel, just to allow you to get the most out of your time. So today I'm going to start off with cholera, uh, the control points, and everything critical yet you really need to understand. This is essentially everything you need to know in as short of a time as possible. So let's begin. Um, this really starts with a bacterial infection of your small intestine. So the bacterium enters your small intestine, colonizes itself right here in the beginning of your small intestine, the, the duodenum. And it's a bacteria called Vibrio cholerae. Now that causes a lot of issues, uh, most notably severe diarrhea, a lot of water in your stool, but it can also cause vomiting, cramping, electrolyte imbalance. You'll see why. Um, so it's spread via the oral fecal route. So what does that really mean? Well, imagine all these patients who are infected by cholera, and then they have, and then their excretions enter the sewer system. Now, if you're in a country which doesn't process their sewage as well, you might get some of that bacterium into your water supply. And now imagine eating um, undercooked fish from those waters, or drinking the water itself. It allows the bacteria to enter and colonize itself within your small intestine, and then that leads to a lot of problems. So the timeline, uh, the onset can really vary. Uh, it can be as short as 12 hours to five days after exposure, but it's not, probably gonna be somewhere in the middle, around two to three days or so. And it can last a couple of days. So I said approximately five, but it's you, you get the gist of how long it typically stays around for. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the fundamentals bef before I get into the actual mechanism. So for any channel, this is just your small intestine, by the way. And this is the lymph, this is your arteries, this is your veins. And these are intestinal epithelium cells all around. So this would be a villi in a sense. Um, you need two things though for, for membranes to work effectively. You need to have a driving force, which in this diagram here, you have all these sodiums on the outside. They're not only electrostatically propelling each other because they're all positive, there's also a higher concentration of them on the outside. So you get the need to come inside, to, to go somewhere else in a sense. But you also need the path. So that's where channels come in. So right here you have, say, a passive channel where the sodium enters. Then you also don't want to just go back outside. So now you have an active channel on the other side, which allows the sodium to enter through and enter this extracellular space right here. Or another cell, whatever may be on the other side. But the, what stops the sodium from just leaving outside the side? outside from uh, the side of the cell on the lateral sides and that's why we have these tight junctions so these tight junctions it's, it's almost like the cells themselves form a membrane of sorts and it prevents sodium or whatever the ion may be from just going through the cell and then leaving out the sides so that's the purpose of these okay now um Going back to the small intestine and a bit of anatomy, at the top you have the villi where most absorption takes place. Um, it includes sodium channels that allow sodium ions to enter through, kind of like what I had illustrated before. But as you know, wherever sodium goes, wherever salts go, generally, water tends to follow. So this is where your water from the small intestine is absorbed. At the bottom in these crypts, uh, you have chlorine channels that allow chlorine to exit and that brings sodium along with it on a journey because they're attracted to each other and then water tends to follow. So at the bottom is where the, the water tends to enter. So going to the absorptive sides at the top of the villi, you have these sodium ch channels. There's a variety of them really. Um, you have an antiport for sodium and protons. You have an ENAC. It's just a sodium channel modulated by calcium actually. Then you have a sodium glucose symport, which is neither modulated by CAMP nor calcium. Now, you'll see why that's important in the next slide. But basically, you have all the sodium entering, and then it enters through here. This is the active channel. But the most important part to note is that water and chlorine tends to follow them in between these cells. This is paracellular transport. And that's because the chlorine is attracted to sodium. These are the charges. And then water tends to follow salts, osmosis. Now at the bottom, in your, secret, in your secretory side in the crypts, 
you have the NKCC channel allows chlorine to enter these cells and then it's pumped out via these two channels here, CFTR and CACC. This is the lumen, this is inside of your small intestine. So chlorine exits, sodium is attracted to chlorine, follows paracellularly, and then water tends to follow both of those. So you get a lot of water built up here, and then water is allowed to exit back out here. It's a beautiful system really. But the most important thing to note is that this CFTR channel is a major player. It's it's gonna come back in cystic fibrosis and it's modulated by CAMP. Okay, now that you have a basic understanding of membranes and how ions flow throughout the small intestine, let's talk about cholera toxin. Now going back to cholera, this is the major player. This is the toxin that it creates that causes all of those horrible things to take effect. So right here, you have the toxin and it binds to these, uh, these epithelial intestinal cells with the, this is the beta subunit, there's five parts to it, and the alpha subunit, there's two parts. And it enters via cell type dependent endocytosis. So it's the endosome, it goes to the endoplasmic reticulum. And then here it splits apart, actually, it splits apart into two parts. So beta, alpha, and then here you have your alpha subunit going to your cell. And then it binds with ARF6. So this is, um, ADP ribosylation factor six. We didn't talk about it too much during the lecture, but this is basically a, a a human enzyme that facilitates the role of adding that actual ADP ribose. So the alpha subunit, the alpha one subunit binds with this. Uh, it goes to adenyl cyclase, where you have the activated GS alpha subunit and its GTP, and it ribosylates this. So what this causes is constant activity. Now I'll explain exactly how that works. This is the locus of everything. So typically what happens is, say you have a ligand that binds to a receptor, then this is your GPCR, and this is your trim trimeric G protein. It splits apart and you have your alpha subunit here. Let's say it's a GS sub -pro protein. So it'll activate AC to create CAMP. So your alpha subunit and GTP bound to it is in its active form. It binds to AC, facilitates the production of CAMP, and then it just degrades into the alpha subunit and GDP. So it's inactivated. And this is because of its intrinsic GTPase activity. Now, if you have an enzyme that comes in and it actually destroys this pathway, you're left with only this part. You're left with only the activated GS subunit and the alpha the activated alpha GS subunit and so this leads to constitutive activation of AC and tons of CAM production so this is exactly how this works you have ARF6 and alpha and the A1 toxin it ribosylates the it ribosylates the alpha subunit and now you have tons of CAM production because it can't revert back to its inactive form so what happens is this CAM comes around and it liberates all of these catalytic subunits of kinases. This is gonna be PKA protein kinase A. And protein kinase A plays a massive role in modulating these CFTR channels. So now you see we went back to right where we started. These channels allow the chlorine to leave. And as you remember, wherever chlorine goes, sodium follows, water follows. So now you have tons of water right here in the small intestines. Now, what this also does, because you just think, oh, the sodium is still being absorbed, water can still be absorbed back into your intestines, into your body. But that's actually not what happens. Because you have all these chlorine outside, it keeps the sodium outside in the lumen as well because of the electrostatic charges. This is positive, this is negative. Unlike charges attract. However, CAMP also inhibits the sodium proton channel. And because of the relationship between CAMP and calcium, um, that also plays a role in inhibiting the ENAC channel and other channels as well. So you have excess chloride leaving and, and not enough sodium being reabsorbed. So you have tons of water outside, a watery stool, diarrhea, tons of problems. However, there's one channel 
that is not affected. That's right here. Your sodium glucose simple channel is not affected at all. Like it doesn't include camping as any of its pathways. So this leaves an opening for a treatment we call ORT, oral rehydration therapy. So you have this thing called ORT. Now what happens with ORT is that you give them, it's a simple treatment. You give them salt with glucose. So you exploit this channel right here, which allows sodium to finally enter the cell and that's actively transported out, which allows water to also follow along because typically it, would, it wouldn't be able to follow through because you don't have sodium leaving. But now water is able to go through again and you have some reabsorption. It's not the best reabsorption, but it's enough so that the patient doesn't die or that they survive the bacterial infection. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions, reach out to me. I'll try my best to answer.